<laughs> don't don't drink the Packard Kool Aid, whatever you do. <laughs> oh darn it! <laughs> Hi, my name is Ross Miller, and welcome to the Speedwell Garage, Parkton's friendliest Studebaker Packard workshop. <laughs> Start with our torque converter reassembly. The thing's been sitting around here long enough now, so we're going to uh, start to put it back together. And it's um, not paying its fair share. And it is not paying its <laughs> fair share, not yet. So uh, we have our parts all cleaned up, and uh, we've checked them over for major flaws, and there's nothing particularly conspicuously wrong with anything. So we're going to go ahead and uh, put it back together and the first step would be to reinstall the piston rings on the back of the direct drive clutch piston. Well, let's not do that. But <laughs> not on top of that. Not on top of that. That's too much work. How did you discover mm -hmm. that this nail snot would be the thing? Well, I knew that STP is very slippery. And, but it, it is also, in its natural, the way you buy it is, uh, it is so thick, it's like trying to work with pancake syrup. <coughs> and not Aunt Jemima's, we're talking king syrup. Okay. Um, Which you can only find at Wally's, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love you it. You that in an automatic. No. I do love king syrup, though. I grew up on it. So we have uh, four piston rings, so I just put the gap, and we previously tested them to be sure that they don't just fall down inside the, uh, the place for the piston, the bore for the piston. So we can reinstall them on the, on the piston now. So I usually put the gaps 90 degrees apart. snot on there otherwise it's snot very nice I see what you did there so they literally sit right on top of each other mm -hmm. now the whole 90 degree yeah this if the, if the gaps all lined up mm -hmm. then the fluid could just go all right and it moves between the rings yeah, it will move between the rings. Right. It's Up just into the gaps, so it snakes its way through, basically. Oh, well, it, it actually don't want the fluid to go through. That's the whole okay. purpose ah. of these, is to hold the fluid back. Gotcha now. Right. So this one starts here. The, the thing you have to look out for when installing these rings is that they love, because they're so thin, you can easily get them crossed. <clears throat> kind of like a slinky? Kind of like a slinky, yeah. <laughs> so you see that these rings still move back and forth very easily. Mm -hmm. And if you if you get one of them crossed or stuck in between one of the other ones, they're not they will not move back and forth so nicely. So Mr. Number Four starts over here, and that's usually the one that's a little bit trickier to put in because we're starting to run out of space in our little gap here to get them started. There we go. Yep. Okay, and so they all move very nicely. I noticed that the um, <clears throat> this mark here, this drill bit point, it means that uh, this this particular part by itself has been balanced, ah. which means that you can put it back in any position because it's been balanced by itself. There you go. Put our piston in. Okay. Make sure that the tabs don't land on top of the rings <coughs> portion, otherwise they will break off when the 
clutch releases. No tabs on the raised No portion. tabs on the raised portions. And the thing just basically drops into its hole. There's very there's absolutely no rocket science involved whatsoever. Well pfft. <laughs> neither. I was hoping for rocket science. No rocket surgery. So, um, it's good to have a set of these little pins made up. I just made them out of little pieces of leftover quarter inch brake tubing. And they just drop down in these holes here. You made these? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> make everything around. You make everything around here. Because <laughs> who else is going to do it? The, I, I keep calling the dealer and the dealer never returns my calls. So. Uh, and, and it serves two purposes. It helps us to install the, the rest of the clutch, but it also helps to hold these little spacers in place so they don't go, don't go walkabouts while we are assembling. <laughs> All right, so we put those down over the post. Now we have this wonderful new, freshly relined clutch disc. Uh, that we got from Fatsco Transmission Parts and they sent me a beauty because you see I can sink my fingernail into the <coughs> lining which means that it's going to make a very nice very nice clutch engagement mm. when, uh, and uh, that's what the owner is after so I, right. see, I see the main difference now between that last clutch plate yeah because it was it was harder to brick yeah so um, right. let's talk about uh, Packard Thank Clutch you clutch discs just a little bit more. Um, so whoever relined this has chosen a nice uh, rubberized cork material which is just fine. Some people get their shorts in a wad, in a wad. they want to have Kevlar, really it's not necessary. Um, this rubberized cork will work just fine. Y'all will be dead before this is worn out again. So. <laughs> Just injecting a little, just <laughs> a little injecting prophecy. a little reality into the situation. <laughs> if you're if you're 80 years old and rebuilding an ultramatic, this is going to be the last time anyone ever does this. So <laughs> let's just be realistic about it. Don't don't drink the Packard Kool Aid, whatever you do. Oh darn it! <laughs> but you will notice. Um, They've cut the slots here like they should have, and they've cut the grooves like they should have, because that, that leads the oil, allows the oil to get off of the surface as the clutch engages. But there's one other little thing that needs to happen, and that's that we're going to take a razor blade and we're going to cut a little chamfer onto here. Okay, that's a real word. That's a real word. <laughs> chamfer, C H A M F E R. You win the spelling bee. Yay! And you might well ask, why do we want a chamfer here? And the reason why... we're all chamfering. <laughs> oh gosh, everybody gets, everybody gets a trophy. You showed up. You breathe yeah. oxygen. You get a trophy. <laughs> okay, so we want a chamfer because... <laughs> The reason we want a chamfer, <laughs> this, should all be, this should all be in the video, of course. Yeah. The reason you want a chamfer, and we're going to cut it in on two, two opposite grooves, and then we're going to turn it over and do the same thing on the back side. And the reason why is, and I have experienced this, is that on a cold winter's morning, you start up your, your Packard and you put it in gear, and then the engine instantly stalls. And the reason why it has instantly stalled is that the, uh, the, the centrifugal pumping effect of the clutch disc spinning creates a vacuum when the oil is thick and it actually pulls the clutch disc up against the pressure plate with sufficient power to stall the engine wow. when it's cold. Having this chamfer here makes there be a small cushion of oil that remains on top of the clutch disc to prevent that from happening. I thought when I was younger and dumber that I would skip this step and uh, indeed other people had recommended it to me that you skip this step and then I rebuilt customers 56 patrician transmission and everything was wonderful until that first cold morning 
and every time <laughs> I put the car in drive, the engine stalled. <laughs> so, so the question being, how did you learn this step? Is it was it in the books? Um, was it from someone that you know? Was it an engineering solution? It, it was. Solution? It was. It was an engineering solution. Basically, it was the only thing that had had actually changed. And I, I did do a pressure test to make sure that somehow the clutch wasn't being activated. And the pressure gauge said, nope, nothing's being activated. And so I ended up having to take the transmission back out, take the torque converter apart, take a razor blade, do three minutes worth of work with a razor blade, put it back together, and it was fine. So you won't find this in any? No. Chilton, any? Nope. <laughs> That's that's why you're uh, that's why you're listening to this video, because I've already made just about every mistake you can make with an Ultramatic, and that's kind of over now, at least mostly. <laughs> Did a Baker and Packet hacks with Ross Miller. But this is just these sort of minor and seemingly insignificant details that makes a difference between a nice job and one where you're tearing your hair out. Fortunately, my hair is so short that I can't grasp it to pull it out. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put just a wee little bit of uh, automatic transmission fluid in here now to keep the clutch oh, The Gordon Ramsay wee little bit. <laughs> yes, the Gordon Ramsay wee, wee little bit. <laughs> And yeah, this, yeah, some of his stuff I'm not sure tastes a whole lot better than this. So <laughs> probably gets sued because he has such a hot temper. At this point. So <laughs> just lay the clutch disc on here, and then we'll put our, our clutch hub back in place so that the clutch disc spins on the on the clutch hub. Put a little bit more fluid on there just to keep it company. So the uh... is that like a standard checklist? Yeah. <laughs> keep, it, keep it company. Add fluid. Keep it company. Yes. So it doesn't get lonely. Well, lot, lots of people use fluids to keep themselves company. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. More, more reality sets in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> All right, now it's time to reinstall our clutch discs, which we saw last. It uh, had a nice conical shape to it, and here's the match marks. And here's the match marks, so we'll put him back in the same place, just like that. And we do that for balancing reasons. Yes, we do that for balancing reasons, because nobody likes a shaky Packard. Alrighty. Go on, honey, get started. The red ones here. Just a minute. Should be fine thread. It's not starting nice. Mm. Um, okay, so the in uh, in these we have we have several bolts that look very much the same, but uh, we have eight with this coarse thread, and we also have eight with the fine thread. The fine thread go elsewhere. So this is the coarse thread bolts. Somehow I'm missing a bolt. What did I just do? Okay. Got lots of those. How come we have so many of those? Something is awry here. Of course, it may have been awry. It's not bread, it's pumpernickel. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that curious? Because this is the hardware that came out of this stuff, and now we have nine fine thread bolts and seven coarse thread bolts. This is not right.
Okay. So the uh, these eight bolts in this particular circle, according to the Repro Shop Manual that came with the bushings that I bought, uh, 18 to 20 foot pounds. So this is an inch pound wrench. So that'll be 240 inch pounds. Because 12 times 20 is 240. Just like it was when we were in school. Wait, what? Numbers don't change? The new math? <laughs> I, I know that um, those who subscribe to new educational theories can make that a lot more complicated, but it's really not necessary. <laughs> so how important is torque? How important is torquing? Okay, what happens when you're torquing a bolt? Let me hold up a bolt here for discussion purposes. When, uh, when you're torquing a bolt, you are actually stretching it slightly, which is putting it under a preload. And that preload is necessary because, for example, in this particular instance, when the direct drive clutch engages and the piston comes up, uh, we're pushing against these bolts with several thousand pounds of force. So you want the bolts uh, nice and tight so that they uh, are already preloaded to at least that amount so that when the pressure comes against them, it, they don't just stretch up out of their, their holes and then as the way, on their way back down, they might just have a tendency to unscrew a little bit and unscrew a little bit every time the clutch went on and off. And then eventually everything falls apart. So <clears throat> we, uh, we believe the, uh, the clever people at Packard, because actually these are standardized torque values for a 5 16 coarse thread bolt, this is pretty well a standardized torque value that you would use would be 20 foot-pounds or 240 inch-pounds. So just tighten these up and we're on, ready to move on to the next. So I like to skip around as I do it so that we get up going around twice just to avoid stupidity. <laughs> is, there, is there such a thing as over torquing? Oh yes. Yeah I can uh, <coughs> I can just keep pulling on this wrench until the bolt breaks off. Okay. That, that's over torqued. <laughs> There's a symptom of over torquing. There, 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 right? yeah. <laughs> one of the most obvious symptoms of over torquing, but oddly enough, one of the symptoms of under torquing can also be a broken bolt because mm. it's uh, fatigue cycling. Okay, so that's that. Next.